Welcome to Science for Hire. With your host, Dr. Charles Handler. Science for Hire provides 30 minutes of enlightenment on best practices and news from the front lines of the employment testing universe. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest edition of Science for Hire. I am your host, Dr. Charles Handler, and with me today I have Mr. Matt Scherer. Matt is going to be an amazing resource for listeners and myself, because I'm here to learn more than anything. That's why I'm doing this, right? He's going to be a great resource about legislation related to AI hiring tools, hiring tools in general, etc. He's got a great background and experience and somebody I've been really happy to, to have met over the last year. He's provided me with a lot of good substance and a lot of good food for thought. So uh, as I always do, I let my guests introduce themselves because who knows them better than them. And uh, Matt, welcome to the show today. Please uh, introduce yourself and let us know where you're coming from. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So my name is Matt Scherer. I am Senior Policy Counsel for Workers' Rights at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And CDT is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. that focuses on advancing civil rights in the digital age. I'm actually based in Portland, Oregon. I sometimes refer to myself as the Pacific Time Zone representative of CDT. Mm. Yeah, so my work focuses on a few different things. Pretty much it covers everything where there's an intersection between emerging technologies in the workplace, but my particular areas of focus are the use of artificial intelligence and automation and hiring, the use of electronic surveillance and automated management systems to monitor and collect data on workers, and then looking for ways to elevate workers' voices and help workers empower themselves in the use of data and technology. Super cool. So do you, have you ever had like a 5 a.m. conference call or anything because you're bi-coastal? Yeah, um, and not not often, but uh, but... I'd say probably once a week, I have a call that starts at 7 or 7.30. And then about once every other month, I'll have something that starts at 6 a.m. Yeah. That just goes with the territory. Um, fortunately, yeah. the nice thing about being on the West Coast, everybody else is on the East Coast, is that if I do have one of those early days, for the most part, everybody's offline by 2 p.m. So I can take a nap at... Yes. Uh, at uh, in the afternoon if I have to get up too early and am operating on three hours of sleep. So, yeah, it's always trade-offs, you know, I've, I've found, cause I've worked globally. I lived in the West coast and had clients on the East coast too, but there's the, the only little Bermuda triangle there, whatever is like when you're, when you're getting uh U S Europe and Asia on the, somebody loses in that one. Somebody has got a really ridiculous time that, that you have to yeah. work, but in general, not so bad, you know, so you get off early basically, right? Everybody signs off, which is nice. So cool. Well, we're only two hours apart, which the other thing is two and three hours, you wouldn't think it makes that big a difference, but for me, it, it really does. I feel like Pacific to central, not that big a deal, but no, much easier to deal with Chicago and Nolens than uh, yeah, in yeah, yeah. New York and D.C. So Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the Center for Democracy and Technology, what a cool thing. You know, I was going back to find there's a there's a paper that you guys put out a couple of years ago. I think it's a bill, bill of rights, I think, of, of some sort for I think it was it for it's not candidates, but it was more for well, you can tell us, but um, the after, civil rights standards is that what you're yeah, referring yeah, yeah, to? I think that's it, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it, right, so we you can tell us a bit about that, but what what I thought was so cool is just the scope of the things that the c d t works on i mean it's a pretty pretty large uh coverage across all areas of our society, which we we need stuff like this, we really do, so yeah, I'm happy i I mean see. CDT is a fantastic organization and, you know, I'm, I'm on the privacy and data team. And so we've got people just on my team who work on civil rights in the context of housing and also, you know, kind of general consumer privacy related stuff and health privacy. We've also got teams that work on 
freedom of expression and security and surveillance, kind of you name it. If it touches on digital technologies and how it impacts society, uh, we have an elections team as well. You know, like we, we've got somebody working on it. But I was actually the first person that they brought in with a background in labor and employment issues. So right. uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't quite call myself a one man band on those issues at right. CDT, but I'm usually flying solo. Yeah. What's the most, let me see. What's the craziest thing that like you guys are tracking that where you're just like, Oh my gosh, this is nuts. We better regulate it. It could be hiring, but is there something else where it just, so bizarre or just surreal that you can't believe it sometimes if we're going out across everything that cdt covers probably like election related disinformation stuff like with the rise yeah. of deep fakes and the rise of it, it's it's one of those things where everybody realizes there's a need for regulation but it's very hard to think of what regulation looks like that captures all the things that everybody agrees shouldn't happen, which is like deceptive uses of political candidates, faces and voices to make them appear to say things that they don't in order to hurt their campaign versus, you know, creating satires of candidates. And, yeah, yeah. you know, yes. where do you draw the line between those things is really hard. You know, nice segue into what we're going to talk about, like in like in the employment setting, it's an instance where the technology has moved much faster than not just government abilities to regulate it, uh, government's ability to regulate it, but actually faster than maybe society's understanding of what is even happening. Absolutely. And that creates a lot of challenges for, OK, what's what's the best way to deal with this when a lot of the times the only people who have information on the capabilities and the the potential threats that are posed by new technologies are the people that are putting out the technologies that are causing those threats and creating those potential harms yeah i mean that applies to all this stuff i i, I was listening just this morning to a really good podcast it's the Wall Street Journal's technology podcast, and they had a guy on there, a professor who was talking about, he's an expert in deep fakes, and uh, he was talking about how fast the technology's evolved and, and regulation, how we're going to stop it. And he's like, the only way to do it is to, is to like put it at the, the level where people are receiving the information so that it can be tagged. And uh, he basically was saying, you know, regulation's not, it, it's going to be hard to get regulation to be able to actually provide the defense that's needed, he was kind of like it's a coin flip. It's either going to go where everybody adopts because there is a there's a organization I can't remember the name of it that that's working on trying to regulate the the deep fakes and everything, putting watermarks on them or whatever. But he's like it's a coin it's a it's a coin flip whether it's going to go south and just get nuts or go in the right direction. I think hiring is a good all this stuff's a good example. So yeah, let's dig into the hiring part of it. Things are getting wacky these days and generative AI is even more, you know, uh, up in the ante here, but, but let's talk, go back a second. You were talking about, I keep calling it the bill of rights and I, I, that's not right. The civil rights standards. Yes. The civil rights standards. Talk about that document a little, because it, I love seeing things that are coming from different places than you know, we IO psychologists necessarily are putting out, but are recognizing the principles and things that we know are important. It, it, sh it shows that we're not a bunch of crackpots off here in the corner. You know what I'm saying? So talk to us a little bit about yeah, how the CDT yeah. uh, has come about that and, you know, and, and what your role is, how, how you, how you um, basically see that as important, you know? So the civil rights standards, the full title is the civil rights standards for 21st century employment selection procedures. As that title implies, it's not just about artificial intelligence in the use of hiring. It's really meant to take a civil rights lens to all of the ways in which employee assessments work today. 
And there's there are a couple of impeti. I don't know what the plural of impetus uh-huh. uh, is offhand for it. And one was just the fact that it's been 50 years since the uniform guidelines for employee selection procedures yep. were first drafted. And those have never been updated to reflect changes that have occurred both in social science, but also in civil rights laws uh, since then. The uniform guidelines, for example, don't say anything about disability discrimination. It predates the Americans with Disabilities Act by more than a decade, you know, and all of the considerations of accessibility, accommodation and fairness. That's not, and and the threats in which if you don't provide accommodation to disabled workers, how that can threaten validity, none of that's contemplated by the uniform guidelines. So impetus one was, okay, what would it look like if a kind of something like the uniform guidelines, which is meant to implement civil rights laws with respect, it's a combination of a civil rights document and a scientific validation document. Right. Interesting. What would that look like if you came along with it today? But the real immediate thing that led the group of organizations that worked on that to get together and do it was actually the New York City law. And specifically, what had happened was when the New York City LL 144, back then it was just a bill. When that came along, civil society was kind of all over the place on how to respond to it. Some, n- nobody liked it, but there was a disagreement over, should our strategy be to improve this thing and get it to a point where it's going to meaningfully advance civil rights in the use of these technologies? Or is the bill so broken that we should just oppose it? And there is one group that basically said, you know, forget just working on this bill and opposing it. We think that the use of AI in hiring should just be banned. So civil society couldn't really get on the same page. And I think that that was one of the reasons that the law, the the law ended up going the way that it was when it was enacted, Mm -hmm. which was unfortunately a very, very weak piece of legislation that was riddled with loopholes. And we've seen uh, how few companies have complied with New York City's law since then. And this is kind of a, you know, that happened down the road, but a lot of our predictions, unfortunately, about the loopholes and how companies would exploit them to avoid compliance with the law, those seem to have come true. I think that you and I talked briefly offline about a study that came out a few weeks ago showing that very few companies have posted the information that the law contemplates. Yeah. That conversation about, okay, what's the best way to respond to this, that led to, okay, well, instead of either saying no, and also instead of just using the New York bill as a starting point, what do we think a pro-civil rights approach to employee assessment, and particularly with respect to these automated assessments, what would that look like? And so that idea was behind developing the civil rights standards. And then we brought in a bunch of different civil rights and workers' rights organizations. We brought in the AAPD. We brought in, you know, the ACLU and the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. And all of these different organizations kind of had input and helped develop this set of standards that, you know, implemented these different principles regarding transparency, regarding uh, impact assessments and tests for validity. And one of the things that we really harped on and that, you know, may well be of interest to your listeners is, you know, we really hammered on the point that you shouldn't rely just on correlation as a basis for validity when you're developing a tool in the digital age because it's just too easy to capitalize on chance correlations and to end up having a tool that simply recapitulates cultural aspects of um, the current workforce rather than the ability of candidates to perform essential job functions. So we, we kind of really hammered home on you need to be able to demonstrate that if you're going to, if you're going to use an assessment, you need to be able to demonstrate that it is measuring somebody's ability to perform the essential functions of a job. 
which is what the Americans with Disabilities Act requires. Hmm. And, you know, kind of that was the, the North Star principle, I think, that guided the development of the standards. So how does that differ? And, you know, we talked offline as well about job relatedness is king. I mean, that's the lit- litmus test. If you can't pass that test, you're you're not in compliance. You're not you don't have a tool that is really worth a shit. Honestly, tell me what the difference in job relatedness, the concept of job relatedness would be between, you know, the uh, the, the work you're talking about and the uniform guidelines. Are there subtle differences, real differences? Is it really? The same thing. I mean, the uniform guidelines looks for correlations, but if you have a job analysis and content validity, you know, typically you can, if you have a strong uh, evidence for that, you can, you can fly by with that, you know, is there something different? In- it, and, and there is something a little bit different, you know, the uniform guidelines, it's interesting. I, I'm not a, uh, IO psychologist by training. That's okay. I just play one on TV, exactly. uh, <laughs> but I do know enough about IO psychology to know that the way that the concept of validity is discussed in the uniform guidelines does not reflect the way that validity was understood even in the late 1980s, Yeah, much less today. The uniform guidelines talks about criterion related validity, mm-hmm. content validity, yep. and construct validity yep. as if they are three independent concepts. Uh-huh rather than as three potential independent sources of evidence for validity. So I'm going to interrupt you real quickly. Have you read, this is good beyond the geek thing for probably a lot of people who are listening. Have you read Landy 1986? I Frank Landy's article from uh, American psychologists in 1986. I might have the, the one that I'm stamp collecting I read versus s- science. Not that, but something <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh. That's... Uh, that that does uh, that rings a bell somehow. The article that I that I always turned to as that I thought did a great job of explaining validity uh, back then and even today. What was it? It was uh, Samuel Messick's article. I want to say it was 1988 or 1989, and it was literally just called validity. But it really explained the concept in terms that if you read it then and then you read you know the most modern rendition of the apa standards today like you know he kind of laid out in really really well what validity means and i and the fact that that was you know again just 10 years after the uniform guidelines yeah um and it 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 presented it in such a starkly different way than the uniform guidelines did that just shows you know the uniform guidelines were obsolete almost at the time that they were published and the the way that tests were developed back in the 1960s and 70s you mentioned it you know you would do a job analysis have a team of experts that would figure out okay how will we measure uh, the knowledge the skills that are the abilities that are necessary in order to perform this job you design an assessment you test different you know items and components of the assessment on different people and there was this entire developmental process, but it was very structured and it was conscious. And you knew that you were measuring four specific things as you were developing the product. Yeah. That is not at all how the vast majority of automated tools work. The way that it works is we've got this massive pool of data that's available a lot of the time. Yep. And we are doing the equivalent of a Jackson Pollock painting. We're just throwing everything at the wall huh. and we're seeing if patterns emerge, <laughs> you know, and you're making me laugh because uh, I keep interrupting you. I'm sorry, but I, I'm going to forget. Jackson Pollock paintings are always the ones where everybody looks at it and says, I could do that. Oh, that's not so complicated. It's just paint on a wall. That's what people who are building these tools are saying too, right? We're just going to throw the paint on the wall. It's not that hard. We look at the numbers. Everything's cool. But it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's certainly not easy to develop these tools. But at the same time, you are not starting, you know, Jackson Pollock didn't just, like you said, flick paint at the wall. He knew what colors he was going to use and what patterns he was going to use. I guess uh, <laughs> I don't I, I don't want to be, you know, cast aspersions too, too harshly. But, you know, if Jackson Pollock just put on a blindfold and randomly flung colors at the wall without knowing what colors he had available to him or what colors was on his palette, 
and then afterwards looked for patterns in what he mm -hmm. uh, had thrown against the wall. To me, that's kind of, in some sense, a little bit closer yes. to what I, I, I'm being. I'm being facetious. It's not that random, but at the same, my point is, they put in a lot of stuff knowing a lot of these vendors that make these tools. They put in a lot of stuff that they know is garbage that has nothing to do yeah, with job performance. Exactly, and they're looking for patterns that emerge. They, they hope that some within that garbage, there is some usable material that actually has predictive value. The problem is that if you throw in a lot of garbage, you're going to have some of that garbage that seems to have predictive value just by chance. That's just, you know, if yeah. you have 100,000 features that you put into a system and, you know, you have a, even if you have a pretty strong threshold for statistical significance, the odds are that you are going to have quite a few of those features that have statistically significant relationships just by chance. Even if you use yeah. a 1% threshold, that means that there's a good chance that you will have 1,000 irrelevant factors that make its way into your model. Yeah. So it's, it's that fundamental difference is, I think, part of what's so deeply problematic about a lot of the approaches that these vendors who are developing resume screening tools, who are developing other data-driven rather than content and skills driven assessments in this space are presenting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow, so do you think you think a, a million monkeys with a million cans of paint could reproduce a Jackson Pollock? Pro I was thinking probably easier than they could reproduce a Shakespeare work, I think. I, I, that, that's what I was going to say, right? The, like, what's the old saying that if you give them, you know, a group of monkeys, a typewriter yeah. and put them on an island exactly. for long enough, eventually one of them is yeah. going to write Hamlet. Yeah, it's a million monkeys. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, and it's, but my favorite example is actually, if you flip a coin a few quadrillion times, there is, it's statistically almost certain that you're going to have at least one instance that you get, you flip heads 10,000 times in a row. That's insane. You know, yeah. like if the N is large enough, the highly unlikely random event will appear, will appear as a pattern eventually. But that doesn't mean that that pattern is stable over time. It's just a function of the fact that when you deal with very large numbers of random events, patterns will seem to emerge at certain points. Yeah. That's why, you know, again, like in the civil rights standards, we keep pushing, we, we, we try to push the focus back to you need to demonstrate that the tool is based on somebody's ability to perform the essential functions of the job. If you cannot explain that, if you can only say, well, we can't tell you what essential functions of the job this test is measuring. All we know is that there is some correlation between the outputs of this assessment and whatever potentially flawed measures of job performance we have. Yeah. If that's all you're going on, that correlation, you can't tell me that that's based on the essential functions of the job rather than you know, flips of a coin just randomly coming up heads enough times because you flipped the coin enough times. Yeah. And you know, what you also brought up, man, there's so much, is what we call in our field, the criterion problem. I mean, the criterion is, is crap. I mean, you know, if you're using performance ratings, those are politically motivated a lot of times. If you're using, if you're lucky enough to get objective data, which you can get in some jobs, a sales job, a contact center job, but most jobs don't have objective measurable data you can use. That's my pipe dream is some kind of universal job performance measure that, you know, everybody could carry around with them, but it's, it, it's very probably impossible. I'm trying to think of how a large language model could do that. I don't think um, it's, po it's possible at all, but, you know. I, I always go back to, if there's one class of jobs that is quantified to the nth degree, it's in athletics. Yeah. It's, it's professional sports. And 
even in basketball and football, to use two examples, where you have, you know, the NBA draft and the NFL draft, they put these players through all of these objective measurements. They measure their speed in these different ways. The NFL, at least for a long time, and I think they still do, they have them take the Wonderlick test. And you have statistics uh, and videotape that you can analyze of them playing the exact same sport that they will be playing at the professional level. You have video of them playing it. You have all of this objective information about how they will perform. And still, the GMs miss more often than they hit yeah. on their assessments of these players, yep. even with all of that great information that is available to them. Yep. And the vast majority of jobs, they are not nearly that well Not quantified. nearly as well accomplished. You do not have – yeah. And – so the the notion that, you know, when you talk about things that are ready to be automated, there is a great series of slides. And if you go to, if you Google AI snake oil. Oh, I've got that one. Yeah, yeah. I got that one. That's so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it uses examples of these are things that AI does well. And one of the best examples is spam filters. Yep. And the reason that we can do so well with spam filtering is that, Pretty much everybody will agree on whether or not a particular email is spam. Yeah. It's not that, you yeah. know, like you're not going to, if you ask a hundred people, is this email in this person's inbox spam or is it a right. not spam email? You're going to get agreement usually a hundred times out of a hundred, if not a hundred times out of 199 times out of a hundred. And the ones that are right on the borderline, you usually forgive them for doing so. Yeah. It's, you know, like uh, it's, but that's why spam filters work out so well. We under we have a good understanding and there's broad agreement in, in our society of what a spam email is and what it isn't. Very rarely is that level of agreement and recognition present when it comes to job performance. If you ask 10 different managers to assess a single worker's job performance, you may well get 10 very different answers. Yeah. If you ask... 10 different people even, what are the most important factors in job performance? You may not even get agreement on that. And the point that this snake oil article made is that the former, the spam filter, where there's broad agreement on what good and bad looks like, that's when you're ready to automate something, when you yeah. have that broad level of agreement. Right, right. And when you don't have that broad level of agreement and when something is based on complex social factors and cultural factors and that are difficult to quantify and difficult to reach consensus on, then that is not something that is ready to be automated. That is not something that AI is good at. Interesting. I, I would say that probably even most IO psychologists would agree that we are for most jobs there is not broad consensus on this is what good job performance looks like that we are not good at defining and measuring good job performance for most jobs that exist today that we are getting better at it there are ways to shed light on good job performance but are we capturing most of what matters for most jobs and the assessments that we give workers today in the workplace i don't think so no, we're getting closer. Again, it's better than flipping a coin to our points. And I mean, there are competencies and things about people that you want to have in the workplace. And you could just take a flyer and say, you know, OK, these things are important. Although if you look at that, uh, there's a lot of things that are important. That's why as the job gets harder, too, I like to think about it as a pie. I've used this analogy, right? If you're an entry level job, the pie is sliced into, are you going to be nice to people? Are you going to steal from me? Are you going to show up for work? And can you add and subtract, you know, but you get to a more complicated job and there's 15 or 20 pieces of pie and they're all about the same, but they have com combinations that can, you know, kind of come together. So it is, it is complicated. I'm proudly now can say I, I'm neurodiverse. My goal was to, at the beginning, I totally didn't do it was to say this is the goal of our conversation today, which is to talk about legislation. So we're about halfway through and we haven't talked about legislation much. And I am really enjoying this dialogue and I'm, I'm impressed with uh, your your knowledge of this stuff. And it overlaps with mine. But but where mine is not as good as yours is in the legislation stuff. So 
Let's shift gears a little bit. You mentioned the New York law, right? We did talk about it a little bit, so that's good. The the uh, adjective like uh, milk toast kind of comes to my mind with that. I mean, it's just really pretty ineffective. But it the interesting thing about it is that you know Illinois had that that algorithmic face recognition or whatever law for uh, several years, at least three or four years before. The New York law, I don't know, is New York more popular than Illinois, but for whatever reason, that regulation is what everybody's talking about and what everybody started saying. We better get ready. I know me. I'm like, okay, I can consult on this. Haven't had a lot of takers. (laughs) I thought it was about me. But then when I talk to other people in my field and people like yourself, is nobody's really doing this. I saw a list on uh, somebody shared a list from GitHub with me that had a list of the different audits that have been done. And there's like three or four global corporations and the rest are vendors who are basically having audits done when they have nothing to do with passing the New York City law anyway. What I'm most interested in, because I I think a lot of folks know the deal about New York City and I don't want to downplay it, is what's coming after it and how how different that's going to be in terms of the, the real actual requirements for some compliance. So Two two part question for for really quickly tell us why you think the New York law has gotten so much additional PR but then tell us what's coming down the pike that's actually going to work if anything and why well on the first question I think that the reason that the Illinois law didn't and I, I'm guessing you're referring to the Illinois video AI video interview act I think that one of the reasons that that didn't get much attention is that it was very narrow. It only applied to the use of artificial intelligence to analyze video interviews. It only required notice. It didn't require any sort of impact assessment or audits. And it had no enforcement provisions whatsoever. So there was no consequence if you didn't provide the notice that the bill required. So I think as a result of all of those things, you know, even calling it regulation is a stretch. The New York bill... I still wouldn't quite call it regulation because uh, because of the number of loopholes the bill had in it that companies have taken advantage of, like yeah. you said, to to not comply with its provisions. And instead, what you've ended up seeing is vendors using the the law as kind of an opportunity to do marketing based on their tools. Like, hey, look, we hired an auditor to examine our um, tool under the New York City law and you know, they found that we're bias free, yay for us, bias free, whatever that means. You know, obviously, any IO psychologist knows that if somebody is saying that their tool is bias free, that 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 that, that, that is showing you that they're not being very rigorous about what the meaning of bias is, if nothing yeah. else. What we're seeing happening elsewhere now and what we might anticipate happening next is a kind of an open question. It, at first, it looked like the New York City model might have legs yeah. and it might spread and be adopted either at the at the state level in New York and or in other jurisdictions. And a bill because bills based on it were introduced in I believe four different states, but none of them appears to have advanced. What we are seeing instead is legislation there's there's kind of two different approaches that are going out there. One is um being approaches that are more comprehensive regulatory regimes that are being proposed by civil rights groups and civil society organizations. An example of that at the federal level is the No Robot Bosses Act. Mm, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Which was introduced by Senator Casey earlier this year. Um, And kind of similarly themed legislation is now pending also in a few states, including New York, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, and D.C. Um, D.C. is yeah. not a state, but same difference. And but then there's there's another model where legislation that's not actually modeled on the New York City law, but that is kind of general AI risk management legislation that would impose some requirements on. AI systems, not only when they're being used for employment decisions, but also decisions in a wide range of other contexts, including 
um, housing, some even cover criminal justice and voting, and they would regulate the use of AI in this wide range of different settings. Those bills are mostly being pushed by tech companies. And, you know, somewhat cynically, I say unsurprisingly, they also contain lots of loopholes and kind of fine print that would uh, make it relatively easy for companies to either avoid compliance or to have minimal consequences if their tools are problematic. Right. So those are kind of the two approaches that we're seeing develop right now. And, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, given you know, that I work for a civil rights focused organization. I'm hoping that the that the approach that is based on stronger, stronger regulation and at a minimum greater transparency. I think that problem number one in this space is that candidates often don't even know when they're being assessed, you know, and that's something that's really unique to the rise of AI. That's when you're when you take a paper and pencil employment assessment or you go to an assessment center and engage in you know, assessments there, you know that you're being assessed. And not only do you know that you're being assessed for a job, you usually know what specific skills, knowledge, and abilities you're being assessed yeah. for. You know, AI, it's possible to assess somebody without them even being, even knowing that an AI system is assessing them, much less knowing what exactly it is that they're being assessed for and how that relates to the job that they're yeah. applying for. That transparency issue to me is problem number one. And I think that if I had to make a guess, the the compromise position that we might see happen in legislation is you don't see audit requirements come into play right away, but you do see strong disclosure and notice requirements for candidates. Yeah. And in order for those to be meaningful, the the big battleground is going to be do you only apply the disclosure requirements to tools that play a dominant role in the decision making process and that's basically the approach that the new york city law takes or do you apply it to any ai system or selection procedure that influences or is a factor in the decision making process and I think that the latter has to be the rule in order to achieve meaningful transparency as the experience of the New York City law yeah. shows. Because companies can always say, well, we have a human who has final say on any employment decision, even if that human's a rubber stamp in effect. Yeah. Um, if, it, you know, if a company has the ability to say, well, we don't consider the tool to be the dominant uh, factor in the decision-making process because a human is the final one that signs off on it, then they will, then as the New York City experience shows, they're gonna find a way to escape compliance. I think that that's where the battleground is mm. gonna be though. Like there's gonna be pushback from companies saying, we think we should be able to use AI tools to give recommendations and those shouldn't be subjected to notice or disclosure requirements. And that that's gonna be where the battleground mm. It Man. Is. So if you want a prediction, that's it. It's the moving target. So tell us a little bit about the two that come to mind for me that I think we know a lot more about the EU, but, and we'll get to that in a second. What about California? There's two different things being proposed there. Uh, typically California, you know, the, the legislation that sweeps across the U.S. comes from California and the West Coast actually a lot of times comes over the pond from, <laughs> from Europe, right? But but uh, I read a little bit about the California, I guess they're proposed at this point, but what do you think about those within the context we've been talking about? So it's interesting. So California, what they have as an enacted law right now is the California Consumer Privacy Act. And that was the first privacy and data transparency bill that applies to workers that has gone into effect in the United States. There are data privacy bills that have gone into effect in other states that apply to consumers, but that explicitly don't apply to employees. California's is the first that doesn't carve out employees so that workers have the same rights to data transparency right. and about data processing that apply to consumers. And as a result of that, like the the, the California 
uh, Privacy Protection Agency, which is responsible for enforcing that law, has been, they're proposing rules that would relate to automated management that would basically impose transparency requirements on automated management systems and on automated decision systems mm -hmm. in, in the workplace. So that's still in relatively early stages, but that's kind of the one, you know, black letter law thing that's already on the books and that is likely to see some some action that will require companies to, you know, modify their practices right. going forward. It, it, but there's also a bill that's pending in California. The the original version of it last year was AB 331. It just got reintroduced and I can't remember the the bill number for the new one. But that falls under the category of the general AI risk management regulations that I mentioned earlier. And critically, that says that it only applies to tools that, quote, are designed to be or specifically are modified to be a controlling factor in the decision. So again, that's why I say like that this is where the battleground is going to be on these sorts of things, because unless somebody can prove that a AI hiring tool is the controlling factor in a decision, the company will be able to say that this law doesn't apply to us. And it's a catch-22 because if the company says, well, it's not a controlling factor and therefore they don't provide any disclosures that the bill requires, well, then how would anybody else get the information that they need to disprove their claim? that uh it is not a that it is not a controlling mm. factor in a decision so you know again that's going to be the where the battle lines get drawn on a lot of these issues because as long as that language like that is in there controlling factor right. um or anything like that that kind of gives companies as a as you know an initial right to say this tool doesn't apply to us based on how we use it then the law is not going to be meaningfully complied with. Well, and there's no precedence for these things. You know, a lot of legal stuff is built on precedent, case law, or, you know, case results, whatever, that allow judges to understand how to apply that in a certain situation. But without that, we're, we're waiting for these first things to happen. So that's exactly right. Does the EU have their does the EU have their act together better than anybody else with their new legislation? You know, that's been quite a long time and a lot of debate and it seems like they got it pretty much in place now what's the impact of that how do you feel about it you like it you think it's you know what what should we know uh it's so i mean this bill is i think literally less than two weeks or this act is less than two weeks old in terms of it being signed so it's far too early to say to see how it actually gets implemented and what effect it has but the big thing from the employment perspective is that it classifies employment decisions as a high risk use of artificial intelligence. And that means that in addition to disclosure about the types of decisions that are being made, users of tools that are making those of AI tools that make employment decisions are going to have to do these impact assessments yep. and establish kind of, you know, ongoing monitoring and governance of the use of those tools. I'm somewhat skeptical because in, in some ways, it re the, the, the legislation reminds me of um, the way that air, airliner certifications okay. work, where, you know, for, for, for the uninitiated, the FAA does not inspect and issue certifications for planes. Instead, they issue these safety guidelines and standards and companies are basically given the ability to self-certify that their planes are in compliance. Now, the there is obviously a massive potential liability for companies that don't do this process yeah. correctly because if there's a plane crash, due to mechanical failure of some kind, the liability for the airliner and the PR hit that they take Massive, is yeah. beyond what, what anybody can, mm -hmm. in most other industries, can fathom. But um, as we've seen, that doesn't always lead to great work being done on certifications. And, you know, the Boeing 737 MAX series is kind of the famous example of that. You know, like 
Boeing self-certified that they were that they had that they had done all of these tests that they'd complied with all of these rules, but it turns out that they kind of had you know fudged a little bit on their testing process to claim that well we didn't really make that many changes from this generation of seven three seven versus the last one, and so we can just rely on our testing from the last one. And then when it turned out that the differences were more substantial and it led to a couple of crashes, that turned out to be deeply problematic. So that's the problem with this sort of like, you know, you set standards, but you rely on the companies to implement mm. them. It, you, you know, you, 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 you leave a little bit too much to, to companies that are going to take shortcuts in the interest of pursuing the bottom line. So that's what I'm worried about with the approach that the, the UAI act takes that said, at this stage in the process where industry and technical expertise, where technical expertise on these tools is so concentrated in industry, is there an alternative? Could you have, could you have had a regulatory right. regime that required government certification and government inspection? I don't think you could. Yeah. And Europe isn't like the United States where they can where there's this tradition of relying on private lawsuits to um, kind of, you know, act as a check on corporate negligence and um, abuses. So I'm not sure that the, that the EU AI Act model is something that I would recommend seeing transported to the United States, but it's still very early days right. and maybe it will work, work more effectively than I think it will. Well, if anything, it gives us something to think about. It gives us some examples to draw on. I mean, if you think of GDPR, you know, that became kind of just by proxy adopted in the U.S., but it's a lot simpler. I mean, there's a very clear reg things with that. There's not a lot of gray areas about what you need to do and not do. So it's it's much more simplistic. So let me ask you this. Is is the stuff we've been talking about regulate? Is it ever going to even come close to keeping up with <laughs> like it, it, it's good that we're making the effort, but I feel like it's I feel like a Don Quixote or something, you know, sometimes with this stuff, because technology is exploding, you know, so fast and it takes a long time to figure out this. We're just we're chasing. Are we ever going to catch up ever? <laughs> it, it's a great question. And. My very first foray into AI policy was an article that I wrote nine years ago, and it, it's called Regulating Artificial Intelligence Systems. And I, I kind of dug into all of the problems that are inherent in trying to come up with a government regulatory regime for a technology like AI. What I kind of have ultimately come to the conclusion of nine years later is that, yeah, I think that we are going, I think that regulation is eventually going to keep up with the technology, but it's not going, it can't be regulation in the way that we're usually thinking of it. In, in a lot of ways, it's going to have to rely on a sort of crowdsourced regulation where we require greater transparency of the companies that develop artificial intelligence systems. And we rely on not just experts in government agencies, but we rely kind of in a Wikipedia almost right, like right. way on the general public and people who are knowledgeable about the subject to analyze tools for potential risks and problems. And I think that eventually that my, my gut tells me this is based solely on you know, kind of theoretical thinking and not based on any practical evidence that I have that this is going right. to work. But my gut tells me that that's the only way that we're ever going to keep up with the risks that are involved with these technologies is that we have a requirement of transparency and that as by virtue of that transparency, kind of there's the ability for experts and concerned citizens with knowledge of the subject matter area to raise concerns and flag mm. them. I, I think that absent that, government will always be playing catch up because the resources in private industry are always going to dramatically outstrip whatever in government enforcement agencies are tasked with keeping up with them. I mean, that's how we've seen with the uniform guidelines. And even then, the EEOC doesn't typically go after people. They wait for complaints. I've heard the OFCCP is a little more aggressive, but 
still, there's just think about how many hires are made, how many companies are hiring and how many regulators are there out there to do anything about it. So la last question, and we got to wrap up. Do you think there's ever going to be any kind of mandate that vendors go through some kind of, I mean, I guess it's just what you were talking about with airlines, plane manufacturers or whatever, but I'm just really interested in that because, you know, we've seen the effect already of the New York law where vendors are proactively saying, we're going to, we're going to hire somebody to sanction us. You know, I audit tech manuals, I audit processes, but, but not that many companies even put those out. There's no manda mandate. I mean, the EEOC comes knocking, you got to produce something, but but that doesn't mean that you have to do it beforehand, you know? I mean, I, what I would like to see happen and what I think is, is a possible course to be taken here is that there are audit requirements, not unlike the financial auditing requirements that publicly report, you know, that public companies are subject to, because I don't, I, I, I don't buy the argument that we don't know what an audit of hiring systems and employment decision systems entails. Everybody kind of agrees that, you know, you look for validity, you look for sources of discrimination, yep. like, and it's really the details. It's, it's relatively minor details that there's disagreements right. on. And given the broad agreement on what you need to look for, to me, it makes sense to come up with a system where you say, you need to have an independent auditor who comes in and just as you have an independent accounting firm come in and look at right. your books, you have an independent auditor come in and look at your technology and do all of these things. And just like the independent auditors, you know, their, their ability to be viable as independent auditors are based on their ability to conduct these audits well and to, to maintain at least some level of independence. And when that goes away, as we saw with Arthur Anderson and Enron, you're no longer able to effectively act as an auditor anymore. You know, like, I think that that sort of audit regime is what makes the most sense because, and, and, and the reason that audit regime came into force for public companies was exactly the same reason that we're talking about that I think it makes sense here, which is that regulators don't have the resources to audit the books of all these massive public corporations. So the best way to do it was to set up a market incentive where private actors do so. Um, but you have standards for those auditors that ensure that they are actually independent. Gotcha. Very cool. We got to wrap up. What a great, I could keep going forever. I, I, I really enjoy geeking out on some of the stuff that hopefully our listeners will appreciate. I try to balance the practical with the uh, theoretical and uh, geek geek stuff but just real quick let everybody know how they can follow you um center for democracy and technology look it up it's uh, we're glad it exists but uh tell us how people can track you and uh then we'll sign off yeah so uh i'm matt sharer uh you can just google my name matt sharer uh s-c-h-e-r-e-r-c-d-t -E -E and i should pop right up on google or bing um, and if you want to look at the civil rights standards for 21st century employment selection procedures that we mentioned before, just go to cdt.org forward slash civil rights standards, and that'll take you there. Very nice. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been great having you. As we wind down today's episode, dear listeners, I want to remind you to check out our website, rockethire.com and learn more about our latest line of business, which is auditing and advising on AI-based hiring tools and talent assessment tools. Take a look at the site. There's a really awesome FAQs document around New York City Local Law 144 that should answer all your questions about that complex and untested piece of legislation. And guess what? There's going to be more to come, so check us out. We're here to help. Thank you.